Uh, so uh, when Joan Hall was here, I met her and uh, really uh, thought this would just be a good opportunity to, to gather folks together and do a response in poetry to this particular exhibit, but also the one, ones upstairs as well. Um, like Joan, I'm really, uh, really interested in how we treat the environment and particularly the oceans, uh, how we've uh, essentially turned the uh, ocean into a big garbage dump and uh, of course are damaging it with, by, through global warming and the acidification that was resulting from that. Um, so thank you for coming, and um, I'm just going to start us off with a couple of poems, and then we'll continue with the, whoever signed up on the sheet. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is a one-sentence poem that takes place um, pretty much, well, really close to uh, Johnson's Bayou and Grand Isle, where these materials were found, but a little bit east of that, um, towards Texas. Um, it, uh, it's not the most beautiful beach in the world that I'm describing here. And I also should say that there are two words that might be confusing if I don't explain them. One is awful, which is not awful meaning terrible, but awful meaning waste products, O-F-F-A-L. And the other word is fruit, which is not like apples or bananas, but F-R-O-O-T, you know, that kind of fake fruit, F-R-O-O-T. So this is called Earth Day, host Easter 2017. At the shoreline, soggy offal, lifesavers, skittles, jolly ranchers, dum-dums, fruit flavors and red dye number 40 that sticks to cells till doomsday, permanent as the plastic ground in the gyres of the ocean, or wound as filament in the bellies of dead pelicans hard to spot amid mounds of sargassum here on the brown sand of the Texas Gulf Coast this April littered with pastel halves of dollar store eggs, their innards gobbled a sugar high for the sad-eyed Christ who died so we don't have to, who winged himself unputrified the hell away from here. Thanks. <clears throat> and the next one I'm going to read is called Habitat. I don't, don't think I have to introduce it. Habitat. Who hasn't gotten drunk in a, bar, <clears throat> in a bar like this, near a beach, maybe Florida, on spring break or a business trip or post-divorce getaway, where the neon scrawl of Budweiser or Coors Light or the two green shape of a palm tree seeps through the dirty screen of cigarette smoke. No long expired license plates scale these walls. No baseball caps on nails. Here, strung up fishing nets hold dried detritus, seaweed, starfish, sand dollars, a mounted sailfish, the five foot shell of a loggerhead, a thing like the blade of a chainsaw. You can't stop staring. When the run ragged bartender brings your fourth margarita, you point, what the hell? She makes a gesture that pretends to grow her nose. And because the tequila has turned your brain into an ecosystem swimming with trivia, you remember, sawfish, dinosaur, Around, you've read, 56 million years or more, critically endangered. You know the type, a sun-blistered, soft-bellied jock with a rod and reel and switchblade, nudged it one step closer toward 
likely extinct. In fact, there he sits, three stools over, downing shots. Past time, you lift a fist-sized hunk of coral, anchor your tip, veer toward the door. Maybe it's the booze, or maybe not, but you see clear through the dingy air, the trophy hung, salt damp walls, see the water rising as though to take all of it back, the gulf set to a boil. <laughs> so um, we have Jefferson Hendricks coming up next. Here you go. Little introduction. I'm the poet laureate of 824 Robinson Place, 71104. Um, though my wife may contradict that, make a different argument. Um, I don't write poetry for public consumption. I write poetry for my wife, what's called occasional poetry. I write it on special occasions, birthdays, Valentine's Day, though I missed this year. The muse wasn't with me, alas but I did buy her some Butterfingers, which she loves, so I'm halfway back to salvation, perhaps, or redemption. Um, but I do love poetry. I love listening to our poets that we have here tonight. Um, and I teach poetry not in a formal way, exactly. I teach it, I tend to teach it more as a history of ideas, which is my orientation to uh, literary culture and culture in general. Um, in my American literature class, we've been doing Whitman, so I'm going to read a Whitman poem. Uh, Walt Whitman uh, is, in my opinion, one of the two great poets uh, of America in the 19th century, one of the handful of great American poets of all time. Um, and so I'm going to read a poem set not perhaps too far from the Gulf Coast, one that uh, many of you probably already know, but one that I continually find interesting. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. Uh, this is a poem uh, from one of, maybe his only, and I'd have to look that up, maybe his only trip to Louisiana. Uh, and since live oaks are important around here, and since there are many on my street that were planted in the 1920s, and many of them are, have grown to past maturity and are falling on various cars and occasionally houses in the neighborhood, uh, live oaks are on my mind all the time. Um, this particular poem, I think Whitman wrestles with what is the relationship of the human to the natural. And um, I find that uh, always compelling because I never am completely sure of my own relationship to it. Uh, living in front of a computer screen most of the time now, as most of us do. Uh, but at least occasionally through poetry, I return to the natural world. I return to perhaps that which is most real and that which I think at my peril I forget. And, and I think Whitman helps me do that, along with many other poets. I was going to read uh, Tracy K. Smith's Watershed, but it's very depressing. I decided maybe not. Plus there are about three words I can't pronounce uh, in it, uh, scientific chemical words. But you might want to look that up if you're interested in a rather critical approach to environmental issues. Walt Whitman, I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. All alone stood it, and the moss hung down from the branches. Without any companion, it grew there, uttering joyous leaves of dark green. And its look, rude, unbending, lusty, made me think of myself. But I wondered how it could utter joyous leaves standing alone, there, without its friend near, for I knew I could not. And I broke off a twig with a certain number of leaves upon it and twined around it a little moss and brought it away and I placed it in sight in my room. It is not needed to remind me, as of my own dear friends, 
For I believe lately I think of little else than of them. Yet it reminds to me, it remains to me, a curious token. It makes me think of manly love for all that. And though the live oak glistens there in Louisiana, solitary in a wide, flat space, uttering joyous leaves all its life, without a friend, a lover, near, I know very well I could not. Thank you, Jeff. Loretta Castine is next. Thank you, Ashley. The Ile de Jean Charles on the Louisiana Gulf Coast is going underwater. You may have seen that on CNN lately. It's just a fact. The Native American community there is the first to receive federal money to relocate due to climate change. They will be the first permanent refugees to climate change. This poem was published um, on the speculative fiction website Strange Horizons last year, and it's less of a love poem than a warning of what's coming in a future that gets closer every day. God of the Flood. Sobek, the crocodile-headed god of the Nile, does not take that form here. Here, he's a gator. A thicker snout and less aggressive than his toothy cousin. Our Sobek is mellow, jazz drunk, clawed toes, slow stirring, thick murky bayous. We never held second line for the quarter, just packed whatever wasn't moldy or soggy and left. We fled north, but still the water. Mud brown, brackish, and slick with silt creeps up and up from our drowned cities in the south, where skyscraper foundations rot in floating meadows of giant salvinia, water hyacinth, and hydrilla. Sobek, god of the flood, followed, taking his rest on cypress limbs, tangled with Spanish moss. Reluctant to leave the land named home, we stopped just short of the state line, a place we never thought to visit, and once snickered, they might as well be Texans. Welcomed into a city already bloated with refugees, the people were hospitable, friendly, but we are the guests who overstayed, and this time the water will not recede. When our hosts realized we could not go back, their smiles stiffened and shrank. Homes and shelters closed as stores ran low. But in arms and ammunition, we are all awash in bounty. Sobek circles the perimeter of our lives, his only prey the land. He floats into the shallows that run for miles now, squelches onto the bank in the hot, sullen darkness, and waits. Love that. Thanks, Loretta. And now we have Emily Lighthouser, who is brand new, where are you, there you are. brand new professor here at Centenary. So welcome and thank you. Um, so I'm gonna read just two poems. Um, one is uh, written by a friend of mine um, who is a really good poet, I think. Um, I'm biased, but I do think she's really good. Her name is Caitlin Doyle, um, and she is a poet working out of Cincinnati. Um, both of my poems are about winter. I know uh, we have so much ocean imagery here, but one of the things that I keep thinking about is snow lately and um, the disappearance of winter or winter appearing in um, kind of freakish iterations in places it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, 
So this is called The Last Iceberg, and this is Caitlin Doyle's poem, and this kind of imagines um, what will happen um, as icebergs and other things disappear. When it finally melts, adding to the ocean's weight, our memory of icebergs will turn to water with it. Oblivious blue will fill the space where, so long a shape in air, it became a shape in mind. The butterflies moving each year nearer to the poles will land, finding only sea beneath them. Their wings, heavy with wetness, won't lift. If we ever saw them fly, we'll forget. Nothing to remind us but the nothing in our nets and a null cocoon where the metaphor of metamorphosis was. No words for the part of self wrapped in a hard pupa waiting for the weather to change. The figurative sun will offer only figures of its own speech until even the moon loses all coldness. What is Arctic in us will find no simile, having heat alone to look to for a semblance. Then we'll be mute to the sudden shiver, dumb to the chills that accompany fever. And what will we call the white that comes with age? Not snow but a blossom of the sun, as out of season as the lilac's first bud this February, the robin's early arrival, the aphids all over the leftover leaves. Um, so as I was thinking about snow and how I miss snow the last few weeks, I returned to a poem that I started writing nine years ago. Uh, when there was a blizzard, and if any of you have ever been in a huge blizzard, you'll know or remember that everything takes on these amazing shapes, and so that these familiar objects start to look really unfamiliar in interesting ways. And there's this wonderful quiet that comes with the blizzard. Um, so that's something I love about blizzards. But also, this is also a love poem um, to the person I was with in that blizzard. Um, okay, blizzard. The shapes the blizzard makes we don't understand. The wingtip on a side mirror, the scalloped banks that sift from driveways toward the middle of the road and mute the yellow line. We tiptoe poised above the hip deep snow, one leg suspended, a spinning compass point over concentric rings the wind has traced. Ice-sealed doors and ghosts of steps. There's no way back, except by making a second trail of punctures, closing in again in increments. The palimpsests of evidence in centimeters that will melt. You have a theory. The icicles dangle sideways like that because, but I don't care because my boots are full of snow. A man shovels the space around his car, his gloves stiff and white, lifting off the hours. Maybe he can't sit still inside, so he scrapes his gauzy windshield and goes nowhere. All around are pyramids that might be bushes or fire hydrants disguising earlier disguises. I reach for you. Here's when I insist again that proof is possible, that happiness is more than a swirl of accidents that form the contours of this poem I keep erasing. But if I think this out loud, then things might unbury themselves, and you might shrink, and this feeling disappear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate that. That was really nice. Thank you. Um, Danny Polk. There you are. Uh, 
So I have uh, two poems to read. Uh, the first one is called uh, Revisionist Eden. Here is the conversation between Eve and the serpent. Eve said, from whence do you hail with your beautiful scales and your diamond-shaped head and your spirit so red? And the serpent said, from Terra, from Earth, from your fatherless birth, from whence sacred is the dirt and holy the hurt. And Eve said, might I see her one day? Might I know my mother's face? And the serpent said, of course, if you but eat her fruit and taste not the sugar, but the root. That is the conversation between Eve and the serpent. For God so loved the world, but Eve so loved it more, that she willingly fell from paradise for the mere fact of knowing that the earth would be below. Um, and the second one is untitled. Um, how beautiful a world in which I live, that sometimes water falls from the sky, and I am so privileged as to turn my collar up against it, annoyed. <laughs> So this, um, this poem is uh, obviously inspired by the environment, um, but it was also inspired in part by my mother, uh, who taught me that uh, the purest love means sometimes having to know when to say sorry. Uh, it's called, To the Common Mother. I'm sorry we made you a mother of grief, another story of the Me Too movement. If only for a brief moment did we admire you and aspire to save you, we crave beauty but cave in and slayed by laziness and convenience. No sense in living in anything less than the best to save our children, or you. Into your skin we will rot, not unaware completely of the irony that comes with such carelessness. We tear the dress you have given us, depressed with the rest of humanity I balance on a mountain of trash, about to crash, and softly, with my brash voice, mumbly, mumble, uh, mumble and say, I am sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dory LaRue. Dory teaches at LSUS in case you all don't know, but I think you probably all do. <laughs> uh, I forgot my poem. I left it at work. I ran it off. So I found, I found it on my computer, but I'm having trouble seeing it, and I'm afraid to touch anything. I'm afraid it'll disappear, so it's kind of nerve-wracking sitting back there. But this is my one, I have a one poem. Uh, it's, it's about nature. It's the only poem I had about nature. And I came over here and looked around, and then I kind of rewrote a little bit of it. So hopefully it's pertinent. And I've taken to um, taking the first line and using that for my title out of nothing but laziness. This is called, It's Just Nature, says some YouTube commenters. It's just nature, says some YouTube commenters, when hyenas eat a still-standing, still-fighting buffalo, starting with the testicles. And it's nature again when a male bull, elephant, and musk whacks a baby into the air to attract the attention of its mother. All you bleeding-heart liberal vegans can go to hell, they say, which must be nature. <laughs> some days it seems nature is everywhere. Maybe Pearl Harbor was nature then, and Afghanistan, the Civil War, Kennedy's November, Columbine. Maybe lonely drunks are nature, or maybe buttering up your professor is nature, and matched luggage that falls from a balcony and kills your cat, and fever charts, and Pate's pale, painful history, and room temperature Chablis, decanted too soon, a romaine salad, hiding botulism, and people who drive in the slow lane, <laughs> and one-week brides and their grooms, dead on the turnpike, their ne necks snap like carrot sticks. Maybe wife beaters are nature, child beaters, and dogs who lie down in fear in cages in the laboratory, and the daughter in the subway who jumped on top of her mother after she was pushed under the tracks by a crazy, before the train severed her spine, her arms, one white running shoe, her life as legal secretary with, thankfully, disability. Maybe nature was the crazy who couldn't afford the bullets, but moved from the shadows, his arms rising like smooth rifles. All things considered, there seems to be no news in nature. 
Maybe we should say it's just history biding its time. Children starving in Ethiopia could be nature, and women executed in Afghanistan with loose stones from labyrinths we'll never solve is nature. The vestiges of landfills and the ninth ward low-income housing, sprouting children's ball fields in the Gulf of Mexico, our newest Dead Sea, is not only nature, but a new kind of primitive art, totally unavailable in the jeopardy shared future. If in medieval times, female nature once perverse, but become holy by chastity was nature, and female nature once chaste, but become perverse by holiness was nature, then maybe 1,500 years later, nature is still waiting, gracefully calculating like some mama real vain musician, quietly tuning his rent to own instrument. Or maybe nature's the tenor and we're the vehicle. The first order of business seems to be named first cause, the chicken, the egg, the primogenesis thinginess of things. Because if we aren't careful, that's just nature can be an excuse for the worst of our worst. Anyway, maybe nature isn't the driver, ever thought of that? Maybe nature's the passenger and the drivers, that would be us, are taking nature for a wild ride. The Enola Gay guys stuffed 15,000 tons of nature into a simple gun assembly, a militarily useful gadget twisted and evil as a mass murderer. Wait, wait, it was a mass murderer. Narrowly avoiding the pathetic fallacy, we can say lives were saved by nature. Trees blocked the blast wind, stunned grandparents and children in flip-flops gathered under branches to escape the summer heat. Elsewhere, the wind blast cleaved the branches of 500-year-old camphor trees from their charring trunks. This is from Hypo Center, eight-tenths kilometers and the black trunks were also handedly their own tombstones. But one spring, new buds appeared on their upper stories, and in brilliant, patient green. They were speechless and not interested in what would happen next, just patient, as I said, as though something bigger mattered. Only now we know just how fragile and inexperienced they were, vulnerable to nature as slave, as bully, as thing that can be made to scorch, to vaporize, disfigure for days, weeks, months, years. And though the wind shifted that day and controlled the fires as though the pathetic fallacy was not so pathetic as rumored, what comes up now and again is the specter of some big shot God with his finger on the scale. God must be nature then. To try to beat nature back with a stick must be nature. Yet if we admitted airbags of false motive that we are, can trick ourselves out of our own evolution, offering our limp handshakes to the thing that is the subject of this poem, can we not see how it surrounds us in mixed media, right this minute, arrogating, curling up at our, curling up at our feet, begging us to stop the cautery, the ashes, the making beauty, and the throwing it away, the making it, the throwing it. <laughs> That's nature. Wow. Um, David Haver. That came as a surprise. I didn't know I was next. Um, in, um, I guess it was in April of uh, 2010, the um, Deepwater Horizon uh, oil rig uh, blew up in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, in May, uh, we were in Greece, and um, it seemed that wherever we went, you know, uh, we would end up at a hotel and and uh, there would be a television on in the breakfast room, and uh, the oil was still spilling. I mean, we, every time, you know, every time we would go somewhere, there was another uh, news report, and and uh, it was it was really hard to believe. Well, um, for some reason, uh, the the oil spill that was ongoing was very much on my mind when we um, went to this ancient site. Uh, in the Peloponnese called Assini. And um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a ruined uh, citadel way up on a promontory out uh, in a bay. And uh, the Greek poet George Seferis had visited the site 
um, right on the eve of uh, World War II and wrote a very, very famous poem about it called The King of Assini. And so um, my poem is a kind of um, uh, response, I guess you would have to say, to uh, Seferis' poem, um, but it's written very much with the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico uh, in mind. Um, let's see, is there anything else I need to tell you? Maybe not. Maybe I should just read it. It's called The Fox at Ancient Assini. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> So, so you, you have to um, imagine now, uh, the speaker of the poem is, is, is maybe moving through uh, his uh, telephone picture, the pictures that are on his phone. He's looking at, at sites, you know, that he took pictures of, or else it's a slideshow, something like that. The Fox at Ancient Assini. Those bits of terracotta are, par are, are pottery shards. Some of them even display a trace of geometrical design. And here's the cove below that spot, blue now, which had been green, on what had been the shaded side of the citadel. There on that ledge, when we were peering down at the cove, was it a fox? Fox it became when it uncurled. Now this, encircled by weeds, is the hewn stone mouth of maybe a cistern. The poet Seferis, when he was here with his wife, disturbed a bat. Losing its hold, it came at the sunlight, a spear at, at a shield. Maybe the king of Essenes, gibbering ghost. In Homer's catalog of ships, to which Assini contributes, the king is nameless. This absence provokes in Seferis such nostalgia, he's able to touch the stones where he touched them, where maybe he did, the points of contact regardless abraded by time, and trace there a palpable presence. Whether those rocks that limestone ever belonged to the castle, the Swedes who dug here would know. The Swedes excavated the site. I'm po posing right on the edge of the spur, posing as if I own it. Tolo is there, those white hotels and tavernas lining the shore, and that on the islands, a chapel, the roof, terracotta. My gaze embraced the bay while I returned in thought to the cistern. As I imagined things, its depth escaping the reach of our flashlight adhered to our souls. And our shadows repulsed by the shield-bearing sun deepened a shade underfoot. I pictured off the coast of our home state the crude oil billowing up through deep water's ruptured horizon, tar capturing even this bay. The purple thistles which we had to dodge were leaning to snag the westering sun. The zeal of bees in the lavender blossoms gave the heat the scent of time. We've now retraced our steps and here we are, or rather, here's our table under a cedar. Horeotiki, yes, Greek salad, eggplant imam, giant beans, a sweating carafe of young white wine from Nemea. I glanced away then back and found it gone, I say of the fox, the red fox that awoke in the yellow weeds. You know, um, when, um, when, when we were kids, um, everybody was talking about um, the population explosion. That was the thing. And um, um, 
so, you know, where would people go? Uh, so this poem is, in a way, a response to that phenomenon. I think if it were written today, well, um, maybe um, uh, we would say that uh, there is going to be a problem of overcrowding as the seas rise, right? And people have to crowd in, so maybe they'll have to go to the sea after all. Uh, the poem, this is not my poem, this is a poem by uh, James Dickey, and it's called Giving a Son to the Sea, and um, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, an ecologically conscious poem, as I've indicated, but it's also about um, a son growing up and uh, a father's having to say goodbye to the son because the son is growing up and out, you know? Giving a Son to the Sea. Gentle blondness and the moray eel go at the same time on in my mind as you grow, who fired at me at the age of six, a Christmas toy for child spies, a bullet with a special secret message compartment. My hands undid the bullet meant for my heart, and it read aloud, I love you. That message hits me most when I watch you swim, that being your only talent. The sea obsesses you, and your room is full of it. Your room is full of flippers and snorkels and books on spearfishing. Oh, the depths, my gentle son. Out of that room and into the real wonder and weightless horror of water, into the shifts of vastness you will probably go. For someone must lead mankind, your father and your sons, down there to live or we all die of crowding. Many of you will die in the cold roll of the bottom currents and the life lost more totally than anywhere, there in the dark of no breath at all. And I must let you go out of your gentle childhood into your own man suspended in its body, slowly waving its feet deeper and deeper, while the dark grows, the cold grows careless, the sun is put out by the weight of the planet as it sinks to the bottom. Maybe you will find us there an agonizing new life, much like the life of the drowned, where we will farm, eat, sleep, and bear children who dream of birds. Switch on your sea lamp then and go downward, son, with your only message echoing. Your message to the world, remember, came to your father at Christmas like a bullet. When the great fish roll with you, herded deep in the deepest dance, when the shark cuts through your invisible trail, I will send back that message, though nothing that lives underwater will ever receive it. That does not matter, my gentle blind son. That does not matter. Thank you, David. Um, Jeff Brainerd. I came here from California in 2010. <clears throat> so this is about some California redwoods. North of San Francisco, I think they're called Sequoia Sempervirens. But it started from an article up here on uh, NPR, a description of a group of scientists called Canopy Scientists. It was just fascinating. I think I looked at, there were some podcasts and there were some videos. 
Anyway, that's where this comes from. And um, the first three lines refer to a poem by uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins about a grove of trees that was destroyed, uh, and he lamented that. So that's, he was a, uh, a Jesuit priest, turn of the century. And um, the speaker of the poem is one of the trees. It's called Among Giants. What better place to lay a claim to fame or decry plunder than poetry? All felled, cried the fearful Jesuit. Most of us indeed are second growth, 500 years old on average. But the ancients, almost as old as gnarled Methuselah, flourish in sacred groves, the saws couldn't reach, and seated a skein of green oceans on the foggy, lacrimose northern coast of California. I am ancient. I survived. I'm not the tallest. That's Hyperion, recently discovered by your teams of canopy scientists, zealous, high-minded adventurers really willing to crawl on their bellies under the beached whales of our fallen sisters and Lilliputian-like stand at our monstrous heels to shoot rigging with bows and arrows into our branches to ascend another forest, really, teeming with birds, squirrels, berries, burls, and hanging gardens, and once belayed to the summit, plot with laser beams the height. Hyperion, the tallest living thing on earth. Trees are our lungs turned inside out, a poet writes. Trees are the other kingdom. We're not like you. You've found this out yourselves. We age, but we do not age. The more we age, the more we grow. So it is with myself, but those smart young men scaled me again. Five years have passed, five long years. I haven't grown an inch. They repel to my waist. True to form, I've gained weight to the tune of thousands of board feet of clear heart lumber. Still, this is depressing. They also found a woodpecker's ravenous boring. Sap oozes. It's a scratch, but it's enough. Theoretically, we could grow forever, live forever. 3,000 years is nothing to laugh at. It's the water. It's a long way to the top. It's the plumbing. At the top, I'm parched. Leaves tremble, few and small. In the end, we share your beastly fate. Gravity kills us. suggested that, uh, to me, or I wouldn't have written this poem, that I should write a poem about uh, a whale. Um, specifically, the whale, I don't know if you all were watching this YouTube continuation saga of the, the mother whale um, in the Pacific Northwest who lost her calf and carried the calf for 14 days on her nose. Um, but anyway. So anyway, she suggested it to me the last time we read together and I went home and actually uh, worked on a poem. And so here it is. And it has a really long note. So anyway, I'll read that first. It's called the J35. Uh, from July 24th to August 9th, 2018, scientists observed J35, a southern resident killer whale in the Pacific Northwest carrying the carcass of her newborn calf, a record-breaking tour of grief. For the past three years, no calf has survived among these orcas, all of whom suffer from malnutrition thanks to pollution and the demise of the Chinook salmon, the main food source. During the spring of 2018, the Trump administration began forcibly separating families seeking asylum at the southern U.S. border. 
J35. She carried it through summer's flotsam of heat waves, wildfires, Arctic ice melt, reality TV of children ripped from fathers and mothers and kenneled by law untouchable like diseased animals. 17 days, 1,000 miles, Taliqua, her second name, from the Cherokee to together. We studied the videos, the photographs, the slick curve of the whale's black back, the laboring spout. At her head, the small dorsal fin, the pale, slack, toothed jaw of the dead calf. She carried us, too, her refusal to accept. So human, we mourned for the selves we told ourselves we once were. For minutes, her daughter breathes beside her, minutes rich with bonding. Milk comes, the calf nurses. Then its tender blowhole sputters, flukes go still. Day and night, with forehead and fin, she nudges it to the surface, balances, balances it on her rostrum at times clutches its tail in her mouth. Grief feeds her strength enough to fight currents and waves. With trills and clicks and whistles, relatives bring offerings of scarce Chinook, sometimes nose the calf from her, float it themselves. Only when a thrumming like breath Wings from its gaping mouth, a plume of flies. Can she release it to the bitter deep? Return to the life left in her son. Such extreme displays, some scientists say, suggest these whales know what we do not, that they are dying out. We saw the photographs, the videos, fluorescent cages, foil blankets, that shining sea of children. Fifthful, they sank into shallow sleep, woke themselves with wails and shrieks, so primal we lumbered to the surface, blinked once at its million suns glittering, dove in our fathomable, familiar dark. Lots of snacks in the back, and um, some. If anyone wants to buy a book, some of us brought them, so you can just ask. If, do you have a book that you want to sell? <laughs> if you're interested. So, and thanks so much for coming, and thank you, Sean. And I guess that's it. <laughs>